Ah. I'm broadcasting. Okay. I have, I have a this live event will begin in a few moments message. I'm going to reload it. So now they're telling me I can embed this in an iframe, which means I can actually put it on our website and embed it. There he is. There's Tom and Val. Okay, so I can now see you on Google Plus. So the live Hangout thing is working. Okay, so I will then send invitations to a whole lot of other people. You're going to send invitations to everybody I sent you in that email this morning with the addition of Ann Washington. All right, now I'm looking for the email that you sent me this morning. It's called Please, Please hold. hold. Yep. In the meantime, I will be creating a short link of this YouTube URL. What do I have to do to get these people into a copy and paste? And Ann Washington, whose email I can never remember. Now, if you want to, you can turn off the broadcast button. I think just for a moment to pause it so that you're not public. Uh, I think it says end broadcast. That uh, sounds uh, rather. So if you end it, can you start it again? Well, I wonder if, if I start it again, if I'll be at the same URL. So I think I better not. Okay, not so you're be, you're prepared for people to just show up. I am. Va that Valerie this, might not. At be, this but moment, you're hello. I'll try not to pick my nose behind you. You could move out of this camera. Yeah, well, I'm going to. I didn't. She's like, I'm moving. Don't you worry. Well, I thought I would go downstairs and watch it. Yeah. Um, and let you guys know how just a normal person would be viewing us. How would you know that? Because you're going to invite me. Well, you're going to. You I'm have an invitation. Just, I just. I'm going to. I'm about to. Do you said. I was going to say. No, no, I would no, go no. to the Twitter page. I would click the URL, and I would try to do it the way a normal person would do it, who's just viewing. I was going to say you're misunderstanding me. You said something about a normal person. <laughs> no, I wasn't misunderstanding. I was ignoring. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm but sending I was invitations to something people. like that. All right. I can do whatever. Let's move this chair. Let's move the bell. You could cover the. Uh, you could just cover your camera with uh, a cloth or a photo. Yeah, of, really a photo of Hugo Chavez. Live. And mute the microphone. Is going to be talking. <laughs> How's that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just hang the crawfish. Yeah. How about this? Yes, that's perfect. There you go. Get that in the oh, there you go. Oh, it's backwards. Even better. We can do it. Maybe
Hey. Tom. I was muted, Josh. Sorry. Oh, and you're very loud. Uh, no worries. Um, how are you doing? Ah, just well. Yourself? Good. Good. Um, and I see Eric is here. Uh, we're live to the world, by the way. Okay. Very good. Just so you know. I'll try not to say anything too scandalous. I'm putting my alter ego in place. <laughs> uh, I see Eric is here but blacked out. And I'm doing my little inspection of what's behind me in my apartment, make sure there's nothing too embarrassing in the in the background. Uh, yeah, we just had to like lift a full a fully loaded cow out of the room. <laughs> it's been rough here. <laughs> Sarah had her empty tequila bottle stash up here, and <laughs> that took a half an hour to haul downstairs. Oh gosh. <laughs> <coughs> oh, I see Mr. Mill. I, I see a pixelated Mr. Mill. <laughs> I see Mr. Mill being the Pixar logo. <laughs> he is in motion. We need some like dun 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 It's true. He's walking through the hallways of the Sunlight Foundation, which are, as we know, paved with gold. <laughs> Did it? Yeah, dropped like twenty percent. <coughs> wow. Sarah, you should be Baba Booey or something. Or like, you know, <laughs> so much. That would imply that. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, let's not take that up just at this moment. <coughs> so, I, I gather that using this advanced technology, we have no way to know how many onlookers there actually are. There are going to be those of us in the studio audience, and then the thing is going to be streamed out via YouTube to some population of millions or hundreds or perhaps a half a dozen people in the Longworth cafeteria. We don't really know. It's recorded for posterity. It will be recorded for, for posterity. posterity and available on YouTube for posterity. Oh, that's excellent. So Hopefully we'll be able to edit out all this stuff. We're on the record here, fellas. Maybe, um, can, can you, I'm looking at the link that you just posted on your Twitter feed. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm wondering if there's a way to, like, reverse engineer it to the, it's a link to just, uh, the player? Yeah. How would I get to the video? I'm wondering if we can see the the person count on the uh, on YouTube. Let's see. Oh, there we go. On the, oh boy. That's interesting. I'll look. As soon as I get my Paul internet. Miller's working on it as we speak. Except my internet died, so I don't have to. Paul has been excommunicated from the internet. It appears. <laughs> And that can be a problem. After years of giving them more than adequate reason to do so, they've finally struck. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I can I can amuse myself by displaying the live stream while talking on different monitors. Oh, that's nice. That'll be uh, very recursive. Is this automatic camera switching thing? That's a that's a unique Google Hangout. Here it is. Just whoever's talking. Josh is having some vertigo-like experience here. <laughs> I'm well, sure that's, you... that's highly recursive. Yeah. Recursion is what Josh Tauber is all about. <laughs> I do nothing but but recurse. Well, you only have to do it once. <laughs> it knows by voice who to slip to. That's yeah. really smart. Did Google invent that? Didn't they invent the internet, Google? Yeah, they did. <laughs> so, so what? Why do I have a an invite? Like, are all the onlookers going to log in like I did, or no, was I given no. some sort of special invite? 
you were given a special invite, Eric, because we want you among our studio audience, as opposed to those who are merely out there in the uh, cyber sphere. So oh. you you have a front row seat. Also, you can talk back. Oh, I do love talking back. Uh, I would have I would have shaved this morning if I'd realized. Oh well. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Um, oh boy. <laughs> Josh is having one of those, what have I let myself in for? It could be the end of a fine career. So common here at the auto. <laughs> yep, yep. It can't be worse than a house workshop, I'm telling you. I think this will be fun. Yeah, I do too. Seven minutes until the... Is there anything, I mean, we are actually live going out now, but is there anything you want to pre-discuss before we think a lot of people show up? Who who are we expecting the audience to be? What's the level of... Well, we actually sent stuff out to all of our donors who have expressed any interest in government transparency or citizen engagement stuff generally. Uh, we've also put it out through all our social stuff, which reaches how many, Paul? 30 or 40,000. 30 or 40,000 people, so we'll get five. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe seven. Um, I, and as to who they are, it's anybody and everybody, although the stuff that goes from us directly, there are about 100 people in that, government interest list, and I think they're predominantly lawyers. Okay. 60, 70 percent, maybe? I would say in the government list, but in the citizen empowerment list, they're definitely um, all over the place. All over the place. Okay. All over the map. So figure it's half lawyers out of the 100 that we invited, and of the 30 or 40,000, we have no idea. Oh, and mm -hmm. the 100 top law bloggers. Oh, we also invited the 100 top law, law bloggers, and from there are 98, right? Yes. It's kind of like the U.S. News ranking. <laughs> <laughs> I fired two. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, and I can can I tweet out the link to um, to the viewer? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can tweet out the YouTube link. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Whatever. I'm waiting for you guys to tweet the link, and then I'll just. Uh, I think we we tweeted. we have. Uh, oh. It's in the LII Cornell uh, Twitter account, not mine. I'm rebooting, so. And Eric, sorry, I muted you before because you were typing. So um, obviously, feel free to unmute or whatever these guys say. Uh, let's see where that tweet go. There's a, a chat window too that I've been typing in that you have to click the little chat thing to see. Oh, really? How about that? I just sent you yeah, a little uh, blue icon on the left. Well, you technology guys or something, huh? Well, look, it's a little chat window. It's a little tiny chat window. <coughs> I've never seen Tom Bruce in his natural habit before, habitat before. It's true. Here's Andrew Weber hiding someplace. Oh, on the YouTube page, you mean? No, uh, I think he's actually lurking in the Hangout somewhere. Oh, oh, oh Andrew Weber. Weber. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Says he's joined the group chat, but uh, I don't see a... There he is. Oh, he's got a still image. Either that or he's on some sort of drug that allows him to remain very, very still. in the clock. We'll go at what? One after? Yeah. Two after? The tweet's gone out, so people may start joining. How will we know? <laughs> what what link should I be giving out? Oh, I should just look at Cornell's Twitter feed, I bet. Yep. Yeah. Of 
where there's that. I just put it in the chat window, Eric. What just happened? Andrew Weber opened Capture. Smile. <laughs> He's taking pictures. Uh, I'm not. There are two options. <laughs> I'm not really sure what to click. Uh, okay, video has gone off. Okay, whatever you've done, it up. It's back. Am I back? Oh, there we go. I haven't done Google Hangout in a long time, so I'm, all the controls have moved, and uh, it's all. I was going to say, you've done a lot more of it than we have. This is a sort of a maiden voyage for us, but I will uh, explain that at some length. <laughs> <laughs> now Eric's taking pictures. All right, guys, stop playing. It's keep saying smile. All right, all right. You're not ready. <laughs> I can't smile that much. My face will freeze like that. <laughs> Thank you. I was going to say, that that's a reflex. Mine used to be, where's the lighter? Is there still a mustache button in here somewhere? Yeah. Yeah, it's on the left. It's called Google Effects. Oh. <laughs> I don't know how I don't know how that works. Does everyone see that if I put a mustache on you, for example? I think so. Oh dear. <laughs> that just invites all sorts of abuse. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, now theoretically it's two PM and we have other folks watching. We may have had them watching for some time. I don't okay. know. OK? Yes. All right. So I guess since we're officially on the clock at this point, we may as well begin. Welcome. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Tom Bruce. I direct the LII here at, uh, here at Cornell. And with me uh, chatting today are, is, is Josh Tower of GovTrack, waving. Uh, we have a couple of people right now in our so-called studio audience, Eric Mill from Sunlight Foundation and Andrew Weber from Library of Congress. I expect more will be joining us shortly. Uh, this is an experiment for us here at the LII. Uh, we have not done anything with Google Hangouts before. I think it's probably going to be painfully obvious that that's the case before we get too much further into this. But we do have a long tra a track record of working with technologies that we don't understand at all. So this, this, this should be nothing new for us. Uh, I guess, Josh, that I could start by throwing some sort of uh, softball question in your direction about GovTrack. Uh, let me ask the really dumb one that I'm sure everybody asks, which is, what gave you the idea to do this, and, and, and how did it get started, and what is it exactly? Sure. So the site is a reference and tracking service, free service, for what's happening in the United States Congress. And I started working on it um, about, gosh, 13 years ago. Um, I was a freshman in college, and I was learning about the intersection of free speech and copyright law, and we were learning about this law called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act of 1998, and, and um, well, it seemed like a pretty dumb law. So um, this was just as the, the Napster issues were beginning, and I thought, if only people knew a little bit more about what was going on in Congress, we might be able to hold Congress more accountable. and vote people out that we didn't like when they created bad legislation. Um, so that's where it get, got started. I mean, right now, I, I, don't, I don't see myself, um, I don't see GovTrack as exactly an accountability tool. It's more of an educational tool and, and engagement and things like that. Um, but it started from the, from the, um, from the realm of, of accountability. 
Yeah, well, I want to talk about accountability a little bit later because it's it's a concern that we all have in the in the various parts of our our uh, our, our collective enterprise. But uh, again, another sort of softball question: Are who uses it, and and do you ever get surprises? Uh, are you surprised by who's there, or or shocked? Uh, and, and sort of who's the average user, if if any, if there is one? Yeah, I'm I'm a little surprised from time to time. Uh, mostly just learning more uh, more people use it than I realize. Uh, more types of people. The majority are, I think, just everyday citizens that are um, interested in what's going on. I think they, they typically will subscribe to alerts from an advocacy organization like Sierra Club or NRA, and, and those organizations will tell them about what's going on in Congress, and they go from there and um, do a Google search for a bill in Congress and then and, and then come over to GovTrack. So I think that's about 70% of, um, of the people using GovTrack. There's another, um, and, and the other 30% are some sort of legislative professional. So some journalists, probably about 5%. Uh, some uh, legislative affairs people for small businesses whose job it is to figure out what legislation is coming down the pipeline. Um, about 15%, um, so I'm up to about 90% now. Um, some some set of lobbyists, probably about 5%, are lobbyists here in D.C. that, that use GovTrack. Um, and the remaining 3 or 4% is actually staff on in Capitol Hill working in Congress who also have to look up bills every day. Uh, and so... Uh, yeah, uh, so it's so it's a mix, uh, but but the target audience is mostly um, I, the, the audience that I'm really focusing on is everyday people. I'm trying to make things more understandable um, with an eye towards the better that the more the more wonky I can make the site for the advanced user. Eventually, that trickles down and helps everybody understand what's going. Yeah, that's that's kind of been our operating philosophy too. That uh, you 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 sort of pitch a little bit above the middle and and, and, and see if people end up educating themselves. I'm curious, uh, actually, for purely selfish reasons, uh, you you seem to have very very accurate notion of of who's out there and what they do. Do you run a lot of surveys? Are are, are they registered users, or, or or how do you find this out? Yeah, you know, so um, it's uh, so we just we just. Um reached our 200,000th registered user a few weeks ago, which is great. Um, but I don't, I don't regularly survey um, users. I did one survey a couple of years ago. Mostly it's from seeing who's been emailing me. Um, I get emails you know, from people that report problems on the site or feature requests. Um, and so there's some combination of that and Google Analytics and, um, uh, and, and the survey a couple of years ago, yeah. So it sounds like you're uh, you're, you're working with the same bunch of, of bad data that we do when we try to figure out who we've got. Yeah, I mean, in fact, until I did the survey, which was uh, 2010 or 2011, I really had no idea who was using the site. And even though I I would hear from people on a regular basis, no one would tell me who they were. Or, you know, I didn't ask because you know, everybody's busy. Um, so I really I really just truly did not know until very recently who was using and, it. And what percentage of them are conspiracy theorists? A good percentage. A good percentage. Yeah. Uh, there is there is that. <laughs> we have a Facebook page also, and it it is um, skewed towards the extremes for sure. Uh, but that's you know that's maybe natural. I'm part of uh -huh. part of who's interested in it. What's the traffic like? We get about thirty thousand visitors per day on uh, on days when Congress is in session. Okay, and it and it varies a lot when uh, when the season is out, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, in fact. <laughs> Even if, if I'm not paying attention to when Congress is or isn't in session, I can tell from the traffic that uh, what's going on because it really it follows uh, pretty accurately uh, what's going on in the real world, and I, I expect that's because other organizations are doing the hard work of of driving traffic uh, indirectly, um, and so it, so it follows very closely what's happening. So just to just to catch up, uh, we, we James James Jacobs from, from Stanford. Um, we have a few of you guys in the studio audience, and we're going out via stream to a bunch of people who can't respond to us directly and are therefore at our mercy. Uh, I've just asked uh, Josh a bunch of general questions about GovTrack and what it's supposed to do and and how it operates and who its 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 audience is. Uh, do you guys want to chime in with similar questions at this point? I figure we can just turn to you as we go. Rather than the two of us chatting away and waiting, uh, who, who, who's got a good general question for Josh? Crickets. I hear crickets. Uh, James looks like he has a general question, but his mic is muted. <laughs> uh, sure. Um, I have a question for Josh. 
Uh, have you, what have you considered when thinking about doing user interaction features, or have you thought about doing those sorts of things? Like, you know, Open Congress, for example, has uh, forums and voting, and um, I know in some of our products here I've gotten similar requests. So how do you think about that, and is it something you plan on doing? Yeah, I think about it every now and then, and um, I, I generally have two, two sides to this question. So one is, what can I do that's useful? Um, and so forums, and, and I guess for me, useful is educates people or creates some sort of um, uh, true um, uh, tool that creates accountability in Congress or something like that. So I haven't done forums because I haven't found that the sort of net output of a forum it really produces um, either of those things. Um, and, and then the, the second half to, to this rubric is, is anyone else doing it? And um, do I need to duplicate anything? So since Open Congress covers a lot of those things, I haven't, um, I haven't really attempted to, to get into it. Um, I've done some, um, I, I said I don't survey people, but I actually do survey the users kind of unobtrusively every now and then. And I, I was, um, I ran a little button on the site that asked if anybody would be interested in joining a forum or um, a webinar or, um, uh, I forget, two other options. <coughs> and there was some, there was a fair amount of response to it, but um, not enough to get me motivated to actually do anything yet. So, um, yeah, so I haven't, I haven't focused too much on interactivity um, for, for those reasons and the, just getting enough people to be interested in, in doing it in a serious way. Um, I've, uh, in another life, I did uh, a little bit more user interactivity with whether people support or oppose legislation. Um, and starting last week, you can now on GovTrack share, there's a, there's a new share on Facebook button, and you can say whether you support or oppose a bill or, or if you're neutral but you're tracking it. Um, so I'm hoping people uh, will do that. Um, of course, I'm kind of hoping because when they share it on Facebook, then other people might come to GovTrack. So it's, you know, it's a little bit marketing. Um, but uh, yeah, so this is this is the the newest uh, interactivity. Uh, James, are you trying to uh, are you are you trying to speak or <laughs> is, is my is my mute off now? Yeah, you're. I think, you're doing, I think it is. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Hey, Josh, how's it going? Hey, James, how are you? Good. Nice to see you in quote unquote person. Yeah. Um, so what what part of of GovTrack? Um, don't aren't you doing now and that you would like to do other than sort of the user interactivity and things like that I know we had a, a chat um, over email a, a couple weeks back about digitizing historic bills or, or things like that are there other sorts of content or other usability features that that you would love to do or people have been knocking on your door to do um, yeah I mean so for, for background on that for, for the viewers so we've been emailing um, I've, I've, I'm interested in getting um, as much historical information on GovTrack as possible. So uh, I've got all the data from, from Thomas and Congress.gov going back to 1993. Um, and then uh, before that, I have bills that were enacted going back to 1952, I think, um, by the statutes at large. And so now I'm looking, can I go back even further? And um, except as, as James said, um, told me, the costs to digitize things that are not yet electronic is quite large and perhaps out of my budget for now. Um, so that's <laughs> that's one thing. Um, users <laughs> in a different category entirely, users are always saying legislation is hard, hard to understand. Um, and there are a lot of potential ways to uh, to address that, all also pretty costly and difficult to do. So I started, uh, I hired someone to um, help me write bill summaries. So we've done about 10 summaries so far this year, and, and that has gotten um, good reaction so far, so we're going to keep doing that. Um, but um, the summaries only go sort of skin deep. Um, it would be nice to be able to get people that have expert. And so we're, you know, we're writing the summaries, and we don't have expertise on the bills. It would be nice to get people that have expertise, um, even lobbyists, right? Even even the people who you might not trust for expertise, but uh, but have it, um, to get those people to help the rest of the world um, understand the bills that, that they're pushing through. That's something else that I'd mm -hmm. like to, to focus on more. Um, one thing you might be interested in, I know the GAO did a, a digitization program uh, project oh, three or four years ago now with, uh, with Westlaw. Um, 
one of our one of our favorite actors in the library world, quote unquote favorite actors, um, in which they they digitized all of the GAO's legislative histories going back to 1916, I think. Wow. Um, okay. As far as I know, GAO has that content um, now. Whether whether or not they would they would be willing to give that to you, um, that could be really interesting. I think, and mm -hmm. and it could it could under undercut West. Um, which I think would be a good thing. <laughs> yeah, well, I seem to be, um, uh, that seems to be the theme of, of my, my months undercutting West and Lexus lately. So, <laughs> um, not on GovTrack, but in other projects. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write that down. So apologies for about, I'm going to hit on my keyboard. And it's probably going to make some noise. Well, while, you're, while you're typing, uh, uh, while you're typing, Josh, I'll cover for you. Um, I'm good. I got it. OK. Uh, I have a I have a question uh, that we wrestle with very frequently here at the LII. Uh, every so often, we'll think about a project we want to take on, and we will ask ourselves: Is it really our business to be doing this? Or if we do it, will we be preempting something that government might reasonably be expected to do in a way that lets them off the hook? It's a question we wrestle with all the time. And the corollary to it, of course, is once you've embarked on something, as we did many, many years ago with Supreme Court decisions in, in 1992, and they start doing a good job of it, do you want to put yourself out of business? Uh, I mean, I think everybody who's in the studio audience has wrestled with a question like that at some time or the other, and I'm wondering what everybody's take is. Josh first. Sure. Um, it's, a, it's a big question. I mean, I do say... I've been trying to put myself out of business for 13 years, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and Weber, who's you know in the chat, might have something to say about it. But um, I don't. I don't usually not do something because um, uh, because of that. Um, I think um, in in a lot of cases, what what we all do in in our various projects, um, except for Andrew who works on the inside, uh, what we all do are, is sort of um, raise the bar in a lot of ways and and show. What, what can be done. Um, I mean, maybe put that in quotes because it's a lot easier for us to do it on the outside because we don't have to worry about things like, I mean, I should, but like accessibility standards and uh, even accuracy can sometimes get um, uh, not as much attention as it should. Um, so it's a lot easier for us to experiment, um, which perhaps makes the government look bad, but it, it it's, you know, set something for what the government may be able to do five, ten years later or, or sooner, you know, on the, um, where possible. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, um, there's a lot of stuff that we all do that the government will never do. I think that might be one of your upcoming questions. But, um, so there's always going to be stuff for us to do. Um, but I think, I think we'd all be happy if the stuff that we don't have to, that the government can't do, if that's taken over by the government, oh, that got, got all better. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know what you're trying to say. I mean, one one area that used to be very strong that way was uh, actually site analytics and statistics. I don't know how much stuff government websites are allowed to collect at this point. Maybe Andrew uh, can enlighten us. But for many years, these guys weren't able to get their own stats. Uh, we were we were supplying them actually to LRC for a while. Hmm. Okay. You looked like a man who had something to say. No. <laughs> Eric, any response from you? Uh, well, there's a couple of things that come to mind. I mean, and it actually, just Andrew had just asked the perfect question. He says, "Do you ever specifically think of items that the government can't do?" That that's the thing is that the government can't do a lot of things, uh, not for legal reasons necessarily, but because that's not their job. So, uh, you know. Besides uh, doing stuff like campaign and electoral information and how that ties into government information, which the government will never touch uh, unless it's a government agency specifically tasked with that, basically every government agency is confined to using the data that they, that they own, they're in charge of. That's, and it's not just what they want to do, but it's how they view the world, typically. You know, the, you, you have your piece of, of the pie and you do a great job with that and you and that's the most important data to you. And so it's not your, and it's really not that government agency's job, you know, to, to combine it with every single data set out there and form some complete picture of how the government works holistically. 
Um, and part of that is federalism, and part of that is just how humans work in groups. So I think that's a, an absolutely key role of projects like GovTrack, like Cornell, uh, like the work that my institution, the Sunlight Foundation does, is is actually transcending any particular silo that exists in government and presenting a picture that makes sense to regular people and professionals alike. Okay. Anything further on, on this one, guys? Josh? Um, no, I mean, we can we can go into some of the things that, um, that, that are unique to what people on the outside can do or what people on the inside can do. Um, so one... For sort of a historical perspective, um, or perhaps a laugh, but um, for a long time, the um, the Senate didn't publish voting records in a in a useful data format. So, you, if you're a human being, you can go to this go to Senate.gov and find voting records. But if you were someone like any of us um, who wanted to build a big database of it and do an analysis, so if you wanted to figure out how partisan any individual member, any individual senator was, or uh, how often the parties vote together, or you know anything that actually looks across more than one vote at a time for some sort of deeper meaning, you couldn't really do that. And the rationale that was coming out of the Senate, um, I guess the the webmaster's office or one of one of their web teams, um, was that from from their perspective, the senators were sort of reserving the right to publish their voting records the way they wanted, um, and it wasn't up to the Senate as an institutional body to to publish voting records, um, which was very strange concept, I would think. Like, they have a clerk, and the clerk is supposed to publish stuff, but they're not really... Sp so I, I didn't really understand it. But um, if let's give them the benefit of the doubt, right? There, there are and sometimes limits to what government agencies have a mandate to do, and then um, the rest of us can, can step in wherever we're able to, to help out. And actually, you know, so I would create the data that they wouldn't put together and, and then share that, and then other people would, would go do the analyses that they couldn't do before or couldn't do as, uh, as cheap. Um, as cost effective. Anyway, that was fixed in 2009, fortunately. So now we do get the data. <laughs> so really, Josh, you're you're just happy if the if government agencies can publish data that's in a usable format that you can then mash up or massage <laughs> or or do the the further analysis and work that you need to do, right? Yeah. I mean, so I'm, I'm typically after um, this is an interesting question that we might all have a little bit of a different take on. So I'm typically after th uh, data files. So these are things like Excel spreadsheets. Um, uh, of course, I know you know J um, James, but you know, for the viewers, uh, typically things, things sort of equivalent to Excel spreadsheets, large tabular um, um, data files uh, with as much information as possible. So I'm usually after things they already have that's easy for them to share. Uh, I never am interested in things that have privacy or intellectual property implications or um, stuff like that. I go after the easy stuff. Um, other people go after harder stuff. Um, and then you might actually get real real pushback. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so usually the pushback that I get is sort of general institutional inertia where they've got a million things to do and it's government, so it's underfunded and they just don't have time to get to it, uh, which, you know, that's fair. Yeah, we, we've managed to steer clear of... Uh incurring any institutional wrath over what we're seeking. I mean, we, we deal primarily in, in uh, primary sources for legislation and regulations and that kind of thing. And, we, and, and when we do judicial opinions, we're working at the upper levels of the appellate court system where most of the juicy facts have gone out of things long before they got to the appellate court. Uh, People who deal in things like family court records or places where you have domestic violence or rape cases or that sort of thing typically have a much harder time dealing with privacy issues than we have had, although we have had some uh, interesting brushes with that. And, of course, as we all know, Carl Malama and, 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 and company have, have for a long time looked at kind of accidental exposures of all sorts of information. I mean, my, my, my personal favorite was the fact that for many, many years, uh, social security numbers of military personnel showed up in the promotion announcements in the congressional record because it was how they dis distinguished one Colonel John Smith from another. Um, that, that, pro that practice ceased a few years ago, but not before it, it, it had caused a certain amount of havoc. So, you know, we don't, we don't usually get a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of contentiousness about the sort of stuff that we publish. Uh, and, and I suppose that, that brings me by a slightly circuitous route. Uh, 
back to the accountability versus transparency question. I mean, uh, one could argue, and I, I'm going to be a little bit provocative here, that the more aggressive people are in pursuing accountability agendas, the harder they make it for people who want legit who want legitimate bulk release of non-contentious material. I, I, I think there is in some ways a perception that the open access quote unquote free law community is in some ways a little more politically aggressive uh, than it might be. Now, most of that is coming from people who would regard anything as an intrusion. Uh, but I won't say that in some respects the people who press really hard for accountability haven't made the issue of bulk load downloads of, of innocuous stuff much harder. Yeah, I, I ran into that um, a few weeks ago when I, I was uh, I put up a, a We the People petition um, because the Obama administration had put out a new um, uh, a new policy statement saying that all federally funded uh, scientific information would be made open access and available uh, for free um, online and. So I, I wrote a petition saying, well, it shouldn't just be scientific information, it should be all government information. And I surprisingly got pushback from people who said, well, what do you mean by all? You know, and they wanted me to define it. And I was like, well, I can't really define it in the We the, we the People petition because they only allow me you know, 700 characters or something to describe <laughs> the issue. Um, and so I, I thought it was really interesting that you know people were like, well, what about secret information, and what about you know what about all of these other things? And I'm like, okay, let's have as close to all as we can get, um, so that uh, you know libraries will have information for the public, and people like GovTrack and Sunlight and and those uh, kind of folks will have information that they can that they can build um, other sorts of services off of. Um, but it didn't go anywhere, unfortunately. I wonder if the contentiousness of, if there's contentiousness that comes out of the what the free law community is doing, I wonder if that's in their methods or simply in their targets, and if we're allowing, you know, the, uh, the different situations, different kinds of data and government agencies to dictate, you know, who is more, who gets under more and who is labeled as a, as a rabble rouser. You know, it's, we're lucky that you know, our requests for voting records in the Senate you know, is met as a non-contentious issue. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know, there's nothing, in my mind, there's, that's of similar import, accountability-wise, as you know, the work of our judicial branch. Uh, at least you know, the work of our judicial branch painted broadly. And you know, if, so if, if your goal is to get at that information, you know, you, if you care more about the judicial branch, you're just going to have a tougher time than if you care about the legislative branch. And that's not because the data is, the information is more important. And it's not necessarily even because you are an angrier person, though there may be some self selection in who ends up wanting to go after and, and that information and fighting it. Yeah. Uh, it's just, you know, we, our judicial branch, its information is harder to get because there are much there's much more vested interests involved, and it's not limited to the judicial judicial branch. Anywhere where there's lots of money and there's line items involved, you meet this pressure. Um, you know, I, I took up uh, I got really interested actually in a particular campaign by Carl Malamud about um, incorporation by reference, which is an executive branch issue. And you know, the Federal Register in general is one of my favorite stories of open data and the whole government. I tell it all the time, but you know, all of a sudden, if you ask the Office of the Federal Register, what about this little subset of regulations that you end up having to pay money for, all of a sudden you get a much different response. Uh, you have to wage a national campaign to barely get any attention about it. And it, and it puts you in a situation where, sure, like, now, you know, you're, you're, you're militarizing the issue of open access. But is that your fault, or is it the fault that you happen to go after the information where money is involved? Yeah, I mean, and, and, and there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of agendas out there. There was a, uh, there have been a couple of well-known uh, stories in, in Africa in particular where people have gone to open up judicial opinions and had it very, very heavily resisted by the judiciary. And, of course, at, at that moment, 
all the conspiracy theorists run around and say, oh, well, there must be corruption involved or, or there's something. Else. The fact of the matter is that they, they were dealing with a lot of judges who, in many cases, did not feel themselves to be well trained uh, and did not necessarily want uh, their, their half well written opinions out where a lot of people could see them. Uh, it, you know, it, was, it wasn't the, uh, the darkest agenda you could possibly imagine. It was something rather, rather more innocuous, but, but equally persuasive where the judges were concerned. Yeah. I think um, going back to the original question, there's. I think we all we all see this. Um, let's call it sort of turf war um, between the different aspects of the open government or open access movement. So, uh, I um, you can divide the, the the broad movement roughly, let's say, into things like access to the law, access to the the structure of government and who's serving in government access to operational information that helps with accountability, so like government spending information and voting records and stuff like that. Um, access to data related to service delivery and actual government programs that are supposed to accomplish things. Um, and then sort of public data in general. Um, and each of those has a different community. So like Tom, you're in the, the access to legal materials group and so am I. And, um, and Eric and the Sunlight Foundation are primarily in the accountability uh, area, and so they deal with spending and, and uh, elections and operational records. Um, so we all we're all sort of competing for attention in this in the open government movement um, in a way. And when we don't talk and have conversations together like this, it's it's easy to think that it's that it's kind of a zero sum game where we can all sort of only have a few minutes in the spotlight. But probably it's not as um, competitive or as um, as zero sum as as it might seem sometimes. No, I don't think it's zero sum at all. Um, actually, at this point, I want to turn to a couple of questions that have come in uh, come in via Twitter. One of which I think will only make sense to Josh. Uh, the question is, and, and and I quote, "What happened to the RDF experiments?" <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Um, so, from about two thousand five to two thousand um, nine, maybe. Um, I was very interested in the semantic web, um, and RDF, for those that don't know, is sort of the, um, the language, the, the data format of the semantic web. Um, so I was generating a lot of RDF data about what was going on in Congress based on the data that I was generating, and it was interesting because you could, um, you could write um, sort of algorithmic queries that spanned a large cross-section of the data and get interesting answers. So if you want to, so if you know SQL, I'm talking about something like an SQL query for the semantic web. So you can write a query that was like, tell me, um, uh, this is the example I used to use back in the day, um, when, for, for uh, members of Congress that, that voted on TARP or something, whatever it was at the time, um, did, uh, were there more campaign contributions going to people that voted for it or more that voted against it? Um, or like in, in zip code, you know, 19104, which is where I used to live, uh, right? Was it were, were more people giving campaign contributions? I don't know. So anyway, you could go from Federal Election Commission campaign finance data to voting records to census demographic data and sort of all in one query. And it was a lot of fun. Um, the problem was that RDF isn't very fun when you're the only one doing it. So um, my data was all very nicely interconnected, and there weren't too many other people doing semantic web stuff on data that related to what I was working on. So, uh, so it wasn't so much fun anymore, so I stopped working on it. Well, that's changing, I think. Um, actually, I mean, I'd be very interested in knowing, for example, Josh, if you have triples that relate to uh, bill numbers to public law numbers. Yeah, so I have no triples anymore, but I could create them. I've got that now. Uh, <laughs> because, yeah. because we'd like that, actually. Yeah, we, yeah. Can, we can sort of take it from there once we have a PL number, but we don't do bill numbers here. Yeah, and I, yeah, I actually think... just added that to go. No, no, should you? Um, in the in the library. That information. Uh, Sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say about that in particular. That that data emerges organically from from capturing bill information. Fortunately. Um, and so, you know, we that data does get published, just not as triples. But you could, you you could produce uh, any format you want out of out of data once you've got it structured, which is some of the work that Josh and I have done. So that could definitely be done for sure. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so we have, Eric and I have been working on this new project since um, November, maybe, um, uh, on GitHub, called github.com slash United States slash Congress. Um, and it's sort of a community project to gather all the data that we can find about Congress um, and some related stuff um, all in one place with, you know, nice, elegant data structure. And, um, uh, and because it's sort of community run, we've gotten other people that have spontaneously gotten interested in, and it's been sort of expanded in interesting ways. Um, so uh, the PO members are in there also. Yeah, my, my own guess is that the next few years are really going to see semantic web techniques take off in a, in a major way. There's starting to be enough data and enough interest out there. I think you were just a little ahead of your time, Josh, frankly. I, I hope so. I still hope it, it, it happens. Um, just now I'm spending my time on other stuff. So. <laughs> yeah, um, the libraries have, um, the library community has been really getting interested in linked data. Um, and uh, so I think that that goes along with RDF uh, really nicely. And so I think, yeah, this would be a, an interesting time to, to get back into it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, libraries are publishing a lot, a lot more uh, metadata. Um, it's, it's not being tied up in, uh, in, in catalogs as much. Um, and so it, it could be a really interesting time. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, we very much think so, too. It, it, it was sort of interesting to see. I mean, the, the semantic web started out, I, I remember being distinctly unimpressed uh, along about 2002, 2003 with the idea that I could use formal logic to find a hotel room when I ordered an airline ticket. <laughs> uh, that, 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 that didn't hold a lot of appeal for me. But at, at the point around 2005 where the direction of it really did start turning toward link data, toward the idea that you could pile up massive numbers of metadata assertions uh, that could then be combined in, in, in various interesting ways or, or, or around this stuff. That started to look really interesting. I mean, we've been working primarily in the area of regulation and primarily on stuff that we think will allow people better access to regulations. Our, our, our totally stupid example that everyone is tired of hearing uh, is pulling the information from from the, the drug bank database in Berlin together with uh, Title 21 of the CFR such that you can now actually search the federal regulations by drug brand name and find the regulated components huh. and the regulations that apply to them. So wow. you don't need to know the title and all is really acetaminophen anymore. Uh, you, you, you can just search for it and, and, and drug bank will help us do the rest. Wow. There's, a lot, there's, there's a lot of stuff like that that, that one can very easily see. Uh, uh, regulations were the place we started because, frankly, it's a noun-rich environment. Uh, but one can imagine doing equally interesting stuff with geospatial data. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you've looked at that, Josh, but it, the idea of what bills uh, have relevance to what district mm -hmm. I, I think would be quite fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Very hard to figure out right now. Impossible to figure out right now. So. Yeah. And Andrew is reminding me via... Although that was actually... Oh, sorry, Eric. Well, uh, actually, the the precursor register.gov uh, is a site called govpulse.us, which is still up, although it's not maintained in favor of the official one. But it was the inspiration for the official one, and what it did that was interesting is that actually figured it out from the text of each regulation. I missed out the for you, so you could see what the U.S. I think regulatory text is. Oh. Sorry, I was just saying that regular GovPulse is the product project that has been more or less a I think we lost Eric. At a fact. So I think regulations are a little more well suited. I uh, I don't know. Can you can you not hear me at all? Uh, you're breaking up quite badly, Eric. It's like your bandwidth is going. Uh, okay. Okay, he's gone. He's coming back. I guess eBay didn't sell enough today. Um, <laughs> so, where were we? Uh, linked data, 
etc. Oh yeah, uh, another question out of the audience while we're waiting for Eric to come back. Uh, and, and Andrew Weber is lurking in the background. I don't know if he'll want to respond to this directly or not. He seems to be keeping a very low profile. But it's really his question. Uh, Josh, what do you think about beta.congress.gov? And what are the principal differences with GovTrack? What are the complementarities, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, I should talk about beta.congress.gov. I, uh, I think Eric, uh, uh, Andrew should um, you know, showcase. Uh, but it's great. Um, it's, um, uh, I don't know, so, so Andrew, do you want to step in with background? Do you have a mic? Well, okay, meanwhile. Um, so um, Andrew at the Library of Congress and their whole team has been working for a long time on an update to thomas.gov, which is the new beta.congress.gov, and um, probably the viewers of this video um, are familiar with it. Um, so um, it's a it's a huge update. It, the search works tons better, and the um, um, the presentation is tons better. And, um, there's they're still adding data to it. Um, so in terms of the, the, the difference between that and GovTrack, so functionality wise, it's very similar to Thomas.gov um, in that it's um, just it, it's it's their silo of data. Uh, I mean, and they do it very well. Um, but there's there's more in GovTrack than you can get on Thomas. Uh, so on GovTrack, you can get things like committee assignments and voting records from uh, from the House and the Senate, which you don't find on Thomas because Thomas displays Thomas's data. Um, and then also um, a lot of statistical analysis on GovTrack. So missed voting percentages and uh, how likely we think it is for a bill to be enacted and um, leadership and ideology scores applied to members of Congress, which I imagine the Library of Congress will never want to do. Um, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot more context um, that takes advantage of, of a wider cross-section of data on GovTrack than you would find on, on congress.gov. But I should say all of the data on GovTrack comes from Thomas and um, by extension congress.gov. So it is, it is the, the source, right? And so um, to the extent that I ever say that GovTrack might be better, right? It's only better because Thomas uh, exists and does a good job at, the, at that part of it. I don't know if you guys encounter this in quite the same way that, that, that we do, but there, there does seem to be this kind of bizarre characteristic of the internet audience that, 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 that wants there to be only one of these things somehow. And, and, and there's always this question of, well, which one is better? And, and, and can't we centralize it all somehow? And I, I, I've always found that so sort of antithetical to the way that the Internet works uh, <laughs> that, that, it, that it's just puzzling. Um, everybody kind of wants it all under one roof. Everybody wants there to be one thing. But in, in reality, you've got a variety of people doing different value adds uh, with different institutional limitations and different institutional competencies, and, and yeah. why not? And even even the, the presentation. So um, a lot of people think I don't know, there, there's a good um, group of people that think that if only you could build a website that puts all political information in one place, then you'd really have this ultimate accountability tool. But I think it, it runs up against this problem that the human brain can only handle websites that are just so complicated. And you need a, a user interface that's appropriate for the particular task that you have at hand. So, so Congress.gov and Thomas, which have different user interfaces, are themselves differently suited to different audiences and, and go track to a more lay audience um, that needs more explanation. Um, and the LII versus, say, GPO's website for, um, uh, for I think, GPO's website, or any of the other yeah, ones. Were, were, yeah, so, I mean, they, they each presented very differently. Um, and if you removed all the differences and lumped it together, I guess you would sort of get maybe the American idol of, of law, right? Like suitable for everybody, but not really good for anyone. Sorry. <laughs> I'd vote for you, Tom. Uh, but 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 who will be the judges? That's my question. <laughs> well, you. <laughs> who, who is the Paula Abdul of legal information? That that's, that's <laughs> that would be you, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I was hoping for Dr. John Fever, but be that. Uh, so let's see. I what do I have by way of questions here? Yeah, James, James you're, you look like you're itching to say something. Yeah, I I I've been. Um, 
concerned with digital preservation for for a while, um, and so I'm I'm wondering about that aspect of of I guess both GovTrack and LII. Where do you where do you put your data? Um, do you have preservation in place? Do you use the Internet Archive as you know as a backend repository or um, do you even think about that? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll go first. I'll, I'll say that at the moment, our, 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 our preservation policy is best represented by the chagrined look I just got from Sarah Frug, uh, <laughs> which, which is to say that we, we have not given it nearly the attention that, that we ought to. Uh, and I'm as concerned as you are in the abstract. It does seem to be the last thing we get to. Uh, one could use that as a sort of ultimate argument for the existence of librarians uh, on, on some level. Uh, but no, I mean, I think you're right. I think we have been under-concerned with it. We're, we're, we are mostly concerned with running a, a, a current archive for consumption with the public. I think in time we will mature into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that and, and some of the other um, issues that librarians find important are not um, not something that I've tackled yet. So I um, I have on my to-do list to make a backup. So it, I'm at that level of automation for, um, for preservation. <laughs> and I, it's been on my to-do list for about three weeks. So, uh, you know. That's God. not bad. Only three weeks. That's pretty good. Well, that's that's when I thought of it. It's been longer <laughs> since I've actually done a backup. Um, it was one of those moments where it's like, oh, gosh, I really should, should do that. Um, <laughs> So, so there's that. Um, also, um, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, provenance is also another question. Um, so I think um, in the case of LII, their database is pretty much just um, the code, right? And it, it comes from one place. I deal a lot of, with a lot of merging data from different sources, um, and especially for historical information about members of Congress. Sometimes I go to Wikipedia when I need to fill in like a birth date because it's just the best that I can find. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't actually write down where I got the information from a lot of the time. And it, it wasn't, um, it's, it's hard to do and it takes time to do that. And I don't have a good data model for it and like a place in the database. So it was just too much effort, right? And so for what I'm trying to achieve, the provenance question just hasn't been that important. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I'll, I'll chime in there too and say that as, as we move forward on linked data stuff, provenance and curation issues are really going to vault into the foreground in a big way. And, and frankly, James, I'm having trouble finding trained and concerned and interested people in the law library community to work with, mm. uh, which is no knock on anybody in particular, but I got no staff. I, I I got no librarians on my staff, and and ultimately I'm either going to need one or a very powerful volunteer uh, to really make this stuff go. I, I also think, frankly, and I I, I, I I do mean to be somewhat provocative here. Uh, there there is a little bit of a tendency to not listen very carefully to librarians because there has been so much cost insensitivity in that, that community. I mean, well, all of the stuff that's, that's gone on around the issue of authenticity, for example, has been enormously insensitive to the fact that, first of all, there are people out here who are not doing multi-billion dollar high-stakes litigation and don't need the level of verification that you would if you were working for a large law firm or apparently teaching a first-year legal research class. Uh, and, and, and second of all, that, that, that authentication, which we are not in a particularly good position to bear. Yeah, I think the law library community didn't do itself uh, very many favors by uh, by being so, so rigid on authentication um, and, and provenance. Um, and it, it sort of... I think slowed down the the digital um, access process maybe by a couple of years. Um, it I, I I hesitate to to put you know libraries as the uh, as the be all and end all of of um, preservation. I think in the in the paper world we did a pretty good job because we had a, a distributed um, network to do it. Um, I I wonder how how we could do it. Like, I could probably 
host some data here if you wanted to, um, you know, if you wanted to run your your algorithms pointing at Stanford's digital repository instead of um, instead of Library of Congress or something like that. But I don't know that I'd be able to do it for a long time or forever. So there, I think there needs to be a a larger group involved in that. Yeah, well, that that intersects in a very bad way with uh, a, a common funding problem that that mm -hmm. we all have in in open access, uh, which is that foundations and and other institutional funders of open access efforts are very good at starting things and very bad at maintaining them. Uh, you know, it's it's always possible to find a grant to put up a new collection of blah. Uh, nobody's particularly interested in helping you maintain your collection of blah that you've had for 20 years and are, and are trying to keep current. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it, it's not easy for people who, are, who don't have an independent revenue stream or an institutional revenue stream of their own uh, to really take on, A, any sort of long-term effort at all, uh, but B, anything that isn't sort of directly serving data out to the public. If, if they're grant funded, it's very hard, mm -hmm. it seems to me. Before we move on, I wanted to um, put a footnote in. So for, for both preservation and commons, the projects that Eric and I are working on on GitHub actually, I think, take some interesting approaches to that. Um, mm -hmm. I guess we're probably running out of time, so I'll just be brief on it. But um, so we, we're putting in, uh, for one of the projects, the Congress Legislators Project, we're putting the data itself actually on GitHub, which means GitHub is kind of our archive. Um, mm. We're trusting that it's going to be around for a while, uh, but also it provides a certain level of um, uh, authentication with hashes and things like that. Um, and then from the provenance side, you can track every change to the to the data that we're making as we fill in biographical information about members of Congress and things like that. So you can actually see, to the extent that we're recording notes about what we're doing, every change is associated with that note, and you can track back to the, to the point in time when that, when that occurred. Um, <laughs> And there's a, a less formalized benefit that I almost chimed in about earlier, which is that we have these pretty extensive uh, discussion threads. Uh, there's a printer behind me, sorry. These really extensive discussion threads that talk about all the work that we're doing and even research that doesn't end up making it into the data. And this is, you know, basically what, you know, we might end up doing in our own emails that we'd forget about uh, and that, that we that never end up crossing the boundaries of organizations. And so we just have this public archive that will, people will end up for on Google probably above lots of other resources because we're doing all of this stuff in the context of solving problems and resolving things and moving on and annotating everything that we do in formal and informal ways. And that's been really nice, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let, let me, we've, got about, we've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, let me ask primarily Josh, but also everybody else, what should we have asked that we didn't? Um, what, what do you want me to ask you, Josh? <laughs> that's, that's a hard one. Um, you could uh, you could ask me about the DC code. That was a fun so issue. Josh, what about the DC code? Well, <laughs> Tom, uh, let me talk to you about that. Um, so there's this there's this issue that's common in states that states um, contract out with Westlaw and Nexus, which apparently are foreign owned, um, to codify all their statutes. And uh, depending on where you go, the copyright and um, physical ownership status of, uh, of these things is quite questionable and kind of scary. Uh, so here in DC, the um, West and Lexus were trading off as the contractor, and there, there was no publicly available data set of, uh, of the DC code. And so I worked with Carl Malibu and um, someone here named Tom McWright uh, on, on getting access to it. And so um, the DC Council's general counsel um, agreed without much, you know, uh, um, he didn't need much convincing to post the Word document that they had that has the full 50 titles of the code, um, and also to use a Creative Commons CC0 public domain dedication for the files, which means um, to the extent that they may have or have not, to the extent they may have copyright over these files, I say, you know, they basically um, disown the copyright so that um, the files are unencumbered by, by any license or or anything like that. Um, Carl Malamud has a um, project called law.gov, which is at uh, public.resource.org slash law.gov, something like that, uh, where he has 10 principles for how the law should be uh, made available. Um, and I was happy to see that here in DC. We were able to get, I think, about 
got three of the principles knocked out, which is like bulk data, no copyright license, and I forget what the third one was. But um, so I'm hoping that that other places will see what happened here as a model for how the law should be um, how the law should be made available. Okay. Um, anybody else, James? Yeah, and that, that sort of raises the question. I just uh, texted that as well. Um, Josh, are you, are you thinking of moving into state uh, gov track, um, if you will? I know Sunlight has a, has a pretty nice state ledge tool mm -hmm. um, that I've, I've started to, to use. So Yeah, so, so about a year ago, I um, 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 Entered into a partnership with uh, two commercial providers of the data, Bill Track 50, um, Legis Legination, and Legiscan are the company names. Um, and so about a year ago, I, I added state level data to GovTrack because people had been asking for almost as long as GovTrack has been around for that, for that information. And it was okay. But with, with 50 states and 99 state legislative bodies, it's very hard to, to do. Um, it broke on GovTrack a few months ago. I haven't fixed it yet, so there's no new data. So I, right now, um, I may fix it, but I have no particular intention to, um, to dive back into it, and, and Eric and, and Sunlight Foundation has um, really um, picked up the slack on that. And, um, yeah, I, I know it's hard, Eric. Um, <laughs> the copyright issues alone must be debilitating. Uh, yeah, I'm not, well, I'm not on that team. I have watched them with admiration from afar, um, because I think people sort of see, oh, you know, you write scrapers, you get it, and you have to display it somewhere, but man, that has been a that started when I showed up here four years ago and uh, has been run by a team of three people full time for years to, to, to launch with a website that like works well for all 50 states. It's hard. Kudos. Yeah. I know. Well, of course, this is why everybody is now obsessed with bulk data. Nobody wants to do scrapers anymore. They're just too, they're too hard to maintain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I used to always say that. If you're writing a scraper for a government website, it's really lucky that governments move really slowly because then your scrapers don't break. So you know, I, I, that's how I got away with it. You know, this, the scraper that I wrote in 2003 was running pretty much continuously until 2012. So <laughs> it's the land that time forgot. <laughs> oh, about about five more minutes, gentlemen. Anything? Uh, anything we've missed? I had, I had one more question at, 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 a, at a sort of silly uh, theoretical level. I, we, there, there was a, a, a sort of foundational notion in the 19th century public library movement that the reason that you assembled libraries was so that people could uh, educate themselves. They were largely a response in the 19th century to the sort of failure of the, uh, of the educational system, particularly when it came to immigrant populations. Uh, and. I think we've always held, I mean, we're part of a law school in a, in a strange kind of marriage. Um, we, we've, we've always held that, that there was an educational function to what we were doing. And if, if, if you put enough stuff out there, then sooner or later pe people would learn. Uh, and that in time we might make up for the lack of a basic high school civics course or, or, or something of that sort. Uh, do you guys think that's true? I mean, are we fulfilling that function? Do we see it happening with our user, user populations? Is it too soon? Uh, is, is it too much to expect of people? Are they just coming and looking up what they need and, and, and going away again? Uh, what, what's going on? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's very hard to measure, but I'm, I'm sure that it's, that it's true. Um, when I, I, so I, I guess I, I have a sense of this from the feedback that I get from my users and the ways that I see that they're using the site. and. Um, the questions that people have had have changed over time. So um, uh, when the site first launched um, around 2004, the questions were things like, what does HR stand for? And how do I find a bill? And um, I, I searched for HR1234, and I found Bill X, but I thought it was Bill Y. But it turns out, well, there's two HR1234s. In fact, there's been hundreds. So, um, But now the questions are, are different and are more substantive, usually. and um, People understand the nature of lawmaking better, uh, and uh, yeah, and, and use the statistics differently that, that we have. So for sure, people are are, are learning, and I hope it's because of us. Maybe it's because actually civics lessons have gotten better. Maybe you know, um, our users just happen to be better. But I think I think we're. I think we've seen a little bit of that. I mean, our our favorite question here used to be. Uh, Where's the opinion from the Supreme Court in some case where the Supreme Court had denied cert? 
uh, because, of course, that was being reported in the papers as Supreme Court disposes of, you know, whatever issue. And everybody wanted to know where the opinion was. And, of course, there was no opinion. It was a certain denial. It was the court saying, we want no part of this. Uh, it stands as it is. That stopped. That stopped abruptly about five years ago. Uh, and I think, in general, the quality of Supreme Court reporting in the mass media has gone up as well. Now, some of that is that you have a new generation of writer, uh, particularly, you know, I'm thinking of, of Liptak at the, at the Times, who's really writing much more for a lay audience than, than the, the old line uh, Supreme Court reporters really did. But, uh, but even so, I mean, I, I, I think it, I agree with Josh. I think the, I, I think the, the boats are rising. And I don't know, maybe just to put it in a slightly more general frame, I there's no right answer to the question of whether or not it's best and most impactful to serve regular people or to serve the people who serve regular people. And I think that our projects all, like, to some extent, all meet, like, address both of those audiences at the same time. And uh, I don't know which I get more satisfaction from when I see evidence of that. And I don't know that there's a right answer to it, but a lot of people tend to pitch these against each other uh, when, you know, if you're seeking funding or if you're talking with media or if you're trying to affect the national conversation, you get a lot of people who want simple answers to what's not a simple question. Yeah, there are a lot of there are a lot of welcome to my world. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, there are a lot of false distinctions there, and I think there's a general lack of appreciation of how the process works. I mean, many many years ago, or it seems like many years ago now, uh, I was asked by somebody at Open Society Institute to do a three-page summation of the state of legal information in the United States for the benefit of their board, and I said, "Well, I can write 80." <laughs> I said, no, you're going to write three, and my first sentence was, the largest problem with legal information in the United States is that no one knows there's a problem. Uh, and that was largely true. Specialist audiences were well served. Non-special audi non audiences weren't, uh, but they didn't know that they weren't because they didn't really know what their needs were. That, I think, is changing uh, and, and, and changing much for the better. Uh, and on that slightly optimistic note, I, I will exercise my right as, as moderator, tell everybody that it's 3 o'clock, and, and thank you all. Uh, thanks particularly, Josh, and, and, and the other folks for, for taking the time to come in, and thanks to everybody for watching. Yeah, thanks uh, to the, um, our studio audience here for the, for the good questions. And if I can, can I just plug my book, Open Government Data, the book? Uh, <laughs> sure. Some of, some of these issues. Uh, is it available for the, for the Kindle and iPad, Josh? It is available for the Kindle, uh, also on the web, uh, and in physical print as well, opengovdata.io. Okay. okay. Thanks, well, Josh. Thanks, Josh. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Yep, see you guys. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Take care.